Thank you all for being here this afternoon. It is, um, it's one of our favorite days of the year for many reasons, but it's only the last two that we decided we need to share uh, our happiness and pleasure uh, and, and privilege, really, with, uh, with an audience here in New York. And thank you, Indra Nui, so much for uh, spending some time uh, this afternoon and this evening at the, uh, at the gala event downtown with us. Before we get to the subject, and I'm going to share with you exactly what Indra Nui uh, requested that we speak about today, but I have to ask you on the subject of spending some time with us, what's it like to have a little bit of free time? It's uh -huh. been a week, right? It's actually liberating. Yeah. Uh, you know, when I stepped down, I thought it was going to be tough because for 40 years I've done nothing but wake up at 4 a.m. and just figure out how to rush to work and work 18, 20 hours a day. And when October uh, 2nd rolled around, I thought I was going to feel like I was bereft, you know, something terrible had happened to me. And then I woke up on October 3rd and felt light. <laughs> and I realized that there is life beyond working so hard and so... Uh, I assume you didn't wake up at 4.30. I did. That I haven't yet. Yeah. I mean, that part requires reprogramming. Uh, but, you know, I look at this display of our waters, and I say, wow, that's good. Looks good. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, you know, I still, I'm still a PepsiCo CEO at heart, but uh, I'm learning to step aside and actually realize that there's life beyond PepsiCo. Yeah. Well, we could spend uh, all our time today talking about life beyond PepsiCo, but... When we broach the idea of a conversation uh, about leadership, about any number of things that come to mind uh, when we are doing these Game Changer events, uh, Indra Nui said, how about a conversation about the Asian family model? And we've just been talking about some, some thoughts and ideas you, you plan to share soon on this, but, and how that model can serve as a useful example in the United States as we strive for a work-life balance here. Uh, so I wonder... First of all, why that was the subject that you thought uh, we should stress and focus on, and also what exactly is meant in your mind by that Asian model. Thanks for asking that, Tom. Um, I, I, over the last few years, I've been talking a lot about work-life balance and how difficult it is and uh, whether women in particular can have it all. Um, and, you know, sometimes when I speak my mind and tell the truth, I have as many critics as I have supporters. Mm -hmm. And... Um, some people will say that by saying that women can't have it all, I'm putting the cause of women a step back. Others will say, thank God you're talking about it honestly. But the fact of the matter is, in today's world, it's high time we had the honest conversation because uh, there was a great article in The Economist about three weeks ago. It uh, sort of portrays the life of a working woman when she comes home with the phone stuck to her ear and... She walks in the house, the children are crying, the nanny says, I have to leave. The nanny leaves and the house is in disarray. She's still on a conference call but has to juggle all of the uh, jobs at home. Now, I use the word women. I'd say it's uh, parents, but, you know, the load falls disproportionately on, on women. So the big question that I've been asking myself, we've been talking about this issue for such a long time on work-life balance and how do we get society to have a re, uh, replacement rate, which is mm -hmm. you know, pretty impressive to keep the country growing. At the same time, how do we employ all women gainfully in the economy? Because we need them to work. Yet, how do we make sure that they're not trying to do three jobs and still get ahead? Um, and if you really look at the math, it's pretty, uh, it's pretty difficult to make work. And so I started with saying, We've often talked about daycare and childcare, but with the aging boomers, we've got an aging parent issue. Mm -hmm. And so this population in the middle is the sandwich generation because they have to worry about the aging parents and the children. And so the more I thought about it, I started to reflect, especially after I announced my departure, on how did I do all that I did? Because you have to relate it back to your own life. And I realized that I imported a quintessential Asian model to my life. So when I had my first daughter, both my husband and I were you know, just starting out. We had no money. And we were working incredibly hard and traveling. We didn't want to leave our kids with a daycare worker who's not accredited, mm -hmm. who we can't supervise, because those days there was not enough technology to supervise them. So we imported family. In rotation, we prepared a schedule for three so years. Literally, you imported literally. an Asian model. Three years. We asked every aunt, uncle, parents, grandparents, in-laws, everybody, and mm -hmm. said, 
come for three months mm. and supervise the nanny. Mm. And the fourth month, you can visit the US <laughs> on our nickel. Yeah. So for three months, they'd come, just sit at home, watch TV, and have a meal. And we'd take them around shopping over the weekend, which is all they wanted to do. And then the fourth month, they left. So we did that, uh, prepared the schedule. And I said, thank God we have an Asian family mm -hmm. that was willing to step in and help. Now, in return, as they get older, my mother lives with the kids. Mm -hmm. We wouldn't dream of putting her in any sort of a, a senior care. Uh, she's 86, healthy. Mm -hmm. But she contributes to the family, but we take care of her. Right. My mother-in-law is also ta being taken care of by us. And as we get older, we get worried about who's going to take care of us yep. you know, as we get older. So we make sure our kids understand there is an Asian model where you do not <laughs> forget your parents, OK? You right. do not forget it. And I'll tell you a little story. You know, my so, second daughter was applying for college. And she said, you know, mom, I've been at home right uh, next to the house all these years. I'm going to go far away. I said, OK, where are you going? California, Texas, where are you going to go for college? She said, I'm going to New York City. I said, <laughs> NYU, that's next door. She said, yeah, but it's far enough, but not at home. I said, but why New York? She said, well, you know, if something is wrong with you guys, you get sick or something, I want to be there to take care of wow. you. I said, oh, thank God. I brought them up right. I say this to you because I think, I know Asia is changing too, but that Asian model that I grew up with, is the model we need to import here. Mm -hmm. We need to have more multi-generational families living together. We need to have the older generation helping the young people supervise the daycare facilities. Mm -hmm. We need to build communities where the older people and the young people can live together, because all studies show that when older people live with younger people, they actually live longer and healthier. Mm -hmm. And little kids can also learn the value of respect sure. and wisdom from older people. So. I am you know, doing a fairly major piece on this topic. I'm mm -hmm. in the process of writing it. But I honestly believe we need solutions to address this whole issue of work-life balance. And co-opting the entire family right. is part of this solution. And I think it's time we embraced it. So just if we can come back to your personal experience just for mm -hmm. one more moment. I'm fascinated by one thing you said about these people who were coming in uh, from your family in India. So how long did these, th how many versions of the three month uh, visits did you have and did that? So the rule was you should be with us until our daughter can tell us if the babysitter is treating her badly. Mm -hmm. So until our daughter could tell us clearly what was going on with the babysitter, we needed family to oversee them. So we had this grid that we'd planned because we had to, we had this interesting system in India for all of those who are Indians here, you can collect your vacation Right. over multiple years, and nobody takes vacation in India. So some of my uncles and aunts had six, nine months of vacation. So to ask them to give up two months, three months mm -hmm. wasn't a big deal. Mm -hmm. They didn't have anything to do, you see, no expenses. Mm -hmm. We gave them a visit to the US. Uh, they just sat at home and did nothing. They just visited for three months, right. made sure they, the daycare worker was doing her job, yeah. and uh, cooked a great meal for us when we got home. Wow. And uh, things worked out pretty good. And we did the same thing for our second child. Huh. That's great. I, so, I mean, it's probably not your experience, because it sounds like it went swimmingly. There's probably a great novel or, or film one could do about I, the... I don't know about that. Uh, I don't know about novel or film, but, you know, all these visitors have their own challenges. But you can't <laughs> expect to have every part of your life be perfect. Right. You've got to learn to make trade-offs. And if it's trade-offs where every weekend they want to go to the same shopping mall and shop, yeah. That's OK. Yeah. Say that you love it. So. so so to the broader question, then, everything you say, I mean, any of us uh, uh, with, with elderly relatives, I mean, we've all been through a version of this, either as parents or, or uh, children of the elderly. It all, it, it, there's such a common sense uh, uh, wisdom in it. Uh, what do you think, uh, or do you think, it, it can catch on here? What do you think? prevents it from being in place already? I'm not talking now about flying relatives in. I'm just saying that if you, you know, why doesn't it work? I think the focus has been too much on the nucleus family. And we've basically, with mobility and the focus on the nucleus family, we've forgotten that the definition of the family is much broader mm -hmm. than just the nucleus family. And so um, 
two things have to happen. One, we have to broaden our definition of what's family. Second is, the broader family has got to be willing to up and move. Right. Because many people put down roots, and, and I understand that, because when my mother first moved in with us, she struggled not to be in her house mm -hmm. in India. And so it took her about five years to get used to the fact that this is going to be the new house, just live with it, okay? Mm -hmm. But uh, uh, they struggled with uh, leaving their friends and leaving their ecosystem and coming to live with the kids. And they don't want to be dependent on the kids. At the same time, you can't call it a dependency. You've got to call it, you know, the family is reconstituting a different mm -hmm. way. And don't make them feel like they're a burden. Make them feel like they're part of your life. Mm -hmm. So co-op them. Mm -hmm. And that's what we did with all of the extended family. And with my mother, she's very much part of our life. And she has a role to play, a gainful role to play. Mm -hmm. And our whole mindset has to change. You know, Tom, I twist, I'll turn the question another way. If we don't come up with these solutions, how are we going to address mm -hmm. this whole issue of childcare and, you know, a work life? And I don't know how we're going to handle this. We mm -hmm. need solutions. Right. This is one of them. And as our parents get older, as we get older, how are we going to handle aging care? We have a million care worker shortage in the country. Mm -hmm. Who's going to take care of them? Yeah. Not robots. You know, we have to do it. Mm -hmm. So I think. This is killing two birds with a stone. And is it a matter, do you think, of uh, the power of persuasion and, and influential people like yourself making the case? This does not sound like the sort of thing that government really can play much of a role in. Or, or I don't uh, think it's a government issue. I think if more developers start to build real estate communities, mm -hmm. which have the younger people on the outer rim, the aging parents on the inner circle, and then the central community center, mm -hmm. which can also serve as a daycare, where the elderly people can take turns of supervising the daycare. Remember, we are a country where our daycare workers are not trained or certified. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And so, you know, we are entrusting our most prized possession, our little babies, to childcare workers who don't have a certification. So having some supervision beyond technology is not a bad mm -hmm, thing. Right. So um, governments can't do it. I think communities and families and corporations helping to can move this forward. So speaking of corporations, and uh, I, I know a fact here, but I don't know the underlying reasons behind the fact. At, at PepsiCo, um, the, uh, the rate of, uh, or I guess it's, it's satisfaction among the, the women in the workplace was always very high, the folks who would rank those kinds of things at Fortune 500 or maybe other companies. So that's the fact we know. What do you think, well you must know, what are the underlying reasons were uh, for that in terms of either policies put in place. I don't know if it's related to any of the things you've been talking about. Yes and no. I think uh, PepsiCo has always been a company which has had a soul. When you come to work in our company, you actually feel wanted. You're not just a name and a number. You're viewed as an asset. And from top to bottom, uh, it doesn't matter what your level is, uh, you are truly uh, appreciated and welcomed. We have an incredible rewarding, rewarding culture. So, you know, we recognize people a lot. We, uh, you know, from the front line to the factory worker, we have award ceremonies. And so people feel very important in PepsiCo. But we have a lot of programs that uh, allow people to have, uh, make a living and have a life. Mm -hmm. So in many uh, large facilities, we have either on-site or near-site daycare. In our uh, headquarters in Purchase, we have a daycare, on-site daycare facility, and it's just adorable to watch from the time <laughs> Somebody gives birth to the time, I think, a little just over three years, mm -hmm. you can be in the daycare center. And um, the last day that I was there, I went down to read to those kids. And just watching those kids, you know, asking you to read a book, again, read another book, read another book. So I read them three books, and fortunately, they're only three. Otherwise, I'd have spent the whole day reading to them. And then they were lining up to give you a hug. Oh. I mean, it was just the fact that the mothers and fathers were so happy to be able to come in at 7 a.m., drop their kids off at the daycare center, and it's open till 7 p.m. Mm -hmm. They can work late, pick up their child, and leave. Uh, I think if we don't provide those sorts of uh, support systems for families, I don't know how we're going to do it. Now, if you're a small company, this challenge is different. <coughs> Large companies, mm -hmm. we can do it. I don't have a solution for small and medium-sized companies, but for large companies, there's a lot we can do. 
So I want to ask you one more thing, but I should say uh, Indra Nui can be with us till just a little bit after the top of the hour. So if there are questions, I'd be happy to relinquish uh, to, to any of you. But just one quick one, which I learned by, uh, by, by putting, when we were working on this video, which some of you may have seen when you came in, this story that uh, you tell about, uh, speaking of relations with family and women's roles, that uh, when you were accepted to uh, the business school at Yale, mm. and uh, obviously a, a great achievement and a great moment, and you told your family, and well, why don't you explain what your mother's reaction was, and then I'm curious to know, um, it, it, she didn't want you to go, is that right? Uh, yeah, or? actually Yale wasn't so bad. Uh, when my sister got into business school in India, which was the first time somebody was leaving home. Um, my mother said, hey, you can't leave home unless you're married because uh, girls don't leave the home until you're married. So let's get you married and get you out. And my sister was only 17 or 18. And um, my sister said, I don't want to get married. I want to go to business school. They only admit five women in a class of 150. It's a big uh, you know, uh, accolade. I want to go. And my mother said, OK, if you go, I'm going to fast until I die. <laughs> Okay, all right? But my grandfather and my father said, hey, your fees has already been paid. We've already sent the advance in. Don't worry about your mom. If anything happens to her, we'll take care of you. Wow. All right? 24 hours later, mom has broken the fast. My father and grandfather are dead, but my mom's still around. <laughs> Thank God. But you know, I think the men in our family basically said, I'm not going to distinguish between or differentiate between men and women. All of you can dream big. Hmm. So nobody's going to put the brakes on our granddaughters or our daughters. Hmm. So my father was delighted to write the check. He took my sister and dropped her off in business school. And, wow. and once he greased his kids, the rest of us, piece of cake. It reminds uh, me, actually, that one of your predecessors in this brief history of, of the Game Changer Awards, Malala Yousafzai, sure. she was here with her father. And you've probably heard this, but she gave all the credit to her um, you know, getting where she has come to the fact that there was a good male role model sure. in her family. Absolutely. So. We've all had them. Yeah. So uh, are there any questions in the audience? There are a few that have come in online. Uh, yes, we have one in the third row here. If you can wait, sir, for the microphone and, and let us know who you are. I'm Raj Rangarajan, a freelance writer. Now that you're enjoying your retirement just for a week, I know. Yeah. Would you like to join the cabinet, Mr. Trump? <laughs> Me and politics don't mix at all. I mean, because I'm too outspoken. I'm not diplomatic. I mean, I don't even know what diplomacy is, so I would cause a third world war. Don't do it. <laughs> uh, that takes care of that. Uh, <laughs> Uh, any other questions? While a microphone finds this woman here, uh, I just, well, actually, let's let her ask, and then we'll come to this one because it's complicated. Yeah. Hello, ma'am. Such an honor to hear you today. My name is Bhavya. I work for an Indian firm based in New York. It's been a delight to see you all the time, you know, and uh, meeting Indra Nui in person is definitely a great thing. I wanted to know, as a woman, what, what are the two, three things which you would probably like to tell fellow women to be a superwoman like you? What are the very important things that are important in terms of you know taking care of the house, yet yet being there in the corporate ladder? You know, I tell you, my experience and what I did to move here may not be the same, uh, or may not apply to you 100 percent. But I'll give you a couple of three tips. Um, remember the story about my mother saying, "Leave the crown in the garage." Mm -hmm. That is true. Do not bring it in. And I'm, I'm now going to say something which some of you are going to hate me for it. If your husband wants to bring it in, that's just fine. That's his crown. But don't take your crown in. If you want to stay married, if you want to be a daughter, if you want to be a wife, if you want to be a mom, unfortunately, that crown stays in the car. So that's unfortunate rule number one. And if nobody's home and you want to put it on, put it on. But, you know, don't do it with the others around because somebody has got to play the role of, hey, Let's get everybody together. So that's rule number one. Uh, second rule is, um, you know, uh, many of us, and I watch my daughters too, uh, you know, in today's world of equality, we all are fighting for equality. You're right, we do want equality. But at some point, somebody in the house has to call the shots on stuff that's not work-related. 
It relates to leaving the crown in the garage, but uh, nobody's going to be mom. Nobody's going to be mom. Even when we're looking for a daycare worker, we're looking for a temporary mom or a temporary, you know, your daycare worker is a temporary mother. So nobody's ever going to play that role. So figure out how to play that role with aplomb because, uh, you know, we are a species where you give birth to a child. It's not a zebra. It needs us for many, many years before it can be on its own. So um, we have that responsibility and role to play. And embrace it, don't fight it all the time. And the last is have confidence in yourself. Mm -hmm. Most of the women I meet, uh, one of the things I realize is that um, because of all the pressures at home, because of societal pressures, they start to lose confidence in themselves. Don't. Uh, the women I meet are simply awesome. They have the intellectual capability, they have the presence, they can communicate, you know, bring it to the fore. Um, and at the end of the day, if you don't have time for yourself, that's collateral damage. The rest of it, you know, figure out a way to balance it and move forward. Okay. Wow. How did you make time for yourself? I yeah. didn't. You know, when I was working, I didn't. Oh, you don't sleep. That's the only way you make time for yourself, okay? <laughs> but you know what? Uh, you get used to it. Um, there's only 24 hours in a day, so you have to somehow make everything happen. Yeah. I should have said at the outset that, uh, like our other programs, this is being webcast. We have a, a question uh, online from Daniel in Mexico. Mm. So here is a man asking a question, and he's asking from south of the border, how will you continue to be a role model for women and girls? I mean, look, I'm still going to be present. I'm going to be talking in mm -hmm. um, any forum that will invite me, I guess. <laughs> but, this this uh, door writing, is always open. <laughs> no, writing, I'm going to be writing a lot about this topic. And the goal is to visit as many countries as possible and talk to young people um, and give them hope that they can do it for the future. Mm. Um, and keep talking about what can be done by societies, families, governments, corporations to actually help families address these issues of work life. So I'll keep doing that. I mean, I'm not going to go away just because I've stepped down from being CEO. In fact, I think. The fact that I've stepped down gives me more freedom to talk about a lot of these issues. So I'm looking forward to it. Um, Great. Uh, yeah, I think we have two in the fourth row, right? <laughs> sure. Mm -hmm. um, hi, Indra. Lavina here. I wanted to find out from you that what's the biggest treat for you in this? You know, your time is totally your own, so what do you relish doing the most now? Um, you know, this is only one week. This is literally one week since I stepped down. So uh, I'm not yet off the clock because I've still got back-to-back -back meetings for the balance of year. I think when January comes along and my calendar is freer, two things are going to happen. I'm going to have terrible withdrawal symptoms because I'm going to get up in the morning and say, wow, I have nothing to do. Or I have three days where I'm totally free because I told my office to schedule meetings on two days, back to back, and then give me three days, you know, absolutely empty, so that I can do whatever I want. Um, I don't know yet what it is to have three days free, because I've never really had it in 40 years. So learning that is a big thing. Um, they've told me that I need to go to sleep school to learn how to sleep. <laughs> I don't sleep at all. I mean, I'm awake all the time. So I'm looking forward to that. I'm looking forward to learning to sleep eight hours or 10 hours or six hours, okay? Um, and then, you know, I do all kinds of extracurricular things. I play tennis, I do other things, and I'm looking forward to doing all of that uh, much more rigorously as opposed to squeezing it when I have time and requesting the poor tennis coach to show up at 6.15 in the morning when the center only opens at 7.30, you know? Now I can go at nine o'clock, you know? Uh, it's gonna be a whole new experience for me because I'm going to see the sun at a different time. So uh, I don't know how it's going to be, but I know whatever it is, it's going to be fun. So my maids hate it. They're like, when are you going back? Because I, yesterday I was like, this is not clean. And how come this room is so dirty? And they're like, Mrs. Noe, when are you going back to work? <laughs> and you neglected, by the way, in that list to mention Yankee games, right? Oh, I've just been learning. If, if oh, anybody here thinks they're a New York Yankee fan, you may have met your match. Um, I don't know if you want to say I'm anything about that. I'm in mourning after yesterday. Yeah, that was rough. Uh, I think we have but time. But we're going to win today. 
Or win today, yes. Yeah. Well, we're going to have the Asia Game Changer Awards ceremony, and then you can go win. and watch yeah, the games. That's right, of right. course, yeah. Um, we always believe. Yes, ma'am, I think this will have to be the last one. Still in the fourth row? Yeah. Thank you so much, Ms. Nguyen. My name is Nikita Desai. I'm with the Asia Foundation. Um, you mentioned uh, what you were talking about earlier in terms of having uncles and aunts and families being scheduled and including them in your, in your community and your livelihood and um, you know, including them in, into your day-to-day -day life. Um, what I've noticed a lot is you know, being from India, being from Bombay, uh, my mom and my dad had four or five siblings each and now families are shrinking, and um, many are having one child, or maybe just two max. And so with that, we're seeing smaller, smaller families and smaller nuclear families. So could you speak about that a little bit and, and how you envision the future of, of these young Indian parents that are trying to make it work in, in the model that you speak to? That's a great question, because in my family, too, um, you know, my, my mother had eight brothers and sisters, so we had a large group to call from. And my father, my, my husband's side also had a big family. Um, you know, it's interesting, you know, we talk about the sharing economy, we talk about Uber and Airbnb and all of these sharing economies. Everything I look at is a sharing economy. You can share uh, lawnmowers or whatever <laughs> equipment. I think we have to figure out how to create more of a community time sharing to help families and help each other out. Where we've spent the last four years retreating more and more into our family unit and actually not interacting that much with the community, we're gonna to have to interact a lot more within the community. I mean, look, one of the thoughts I have is with 61% of all people living in megacities over the next five or 10 years, you know, that's the number that people are projecting, should we almost say that every thousand families in a megacity, there should be a daycare center? A daycare center where, you know, the families can leave their children and that daycare center as opposed to carrying the children to the workplace or to a daycare center far away. And should we actually provide the daycare workers a space to live about the daycare center so they don't have to travel a long ways to come to take care of the kids? And then the community has to say, if you're late coming from work, I'll pick up your kid and I'll keep mm. the child with me, so we have to break down those walls. But you, in turn, say, okay, here's a voucher. I owe you. I will train your kid in math if you can't do it. So we're going to have to break down the traditional barriers we had in communities, because if we don't do that, I don't know what else is the solution, okay? There is no robot that's going to do all your work, although you could say it does, but that's not what we want. If we want human contact, we're going to have to tap into every available capacity of the community. And we have to create communities if we don't have a ready-made one with our families. And so this is gonna be a new model for us to live with each other. But uh, it is the right model. And that's why I keep saying, at the end of the day, the traditional Asian value, which may be changing to in these times, the traditional Asian values that I'm used to needs to be revived. The joint family, the coming together of communities has to happen. On that note, we could talk forever. I know uh, you can't talk forever, but uh, really, really appreciate. Uh, I know even in your, and I put it this way, retirement, uh, time is precious. So uh, please, a warm hand for uh, Indra Nui. Thank you. Thank you.